look, Kathy McGowan spoke here at Politics in the Pub last year. For me, it was one of the highlights of the, 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 the whole time we've done this event. I think she's a remarkable example of kind of what democracy is supposed to churn out, and that is someone who f has deep roots in a community who puts their hand up to say, I would like to be your representative in a, in, in a federal parliament. Um, so, and look, let's be clear, she knocked off, uh, she knocked off Sophie Mirabella on a 9%, <laughs> yes, <laughs> poor Sophie, uh, but now think about it, she knocked Sophie Mirabella off, I think she was on a 9% margin, and there was a 4% swing to the Liberals, that election, yeah, remarkable going against the tide. Uh, I won a lot of money uh, on that outcome. <laughs> I did. I, the only thing I bet on is elections. Uh, and uh, it's not illegal and it's not insider trading, but I, I think I know more than the market. And one of the things I knew was what her strategy was, because I talked to people about it, and how motivated the campaign behind her was. And when I saw the outrageous odds on offer, I thought, oh, you're worth a roughie. Um, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, look, I think Kathy McGowan unseated a Liberal frontbencher in an election in which that government had a lot, and that party had a big swing to them. And what that says is that if, if a politician gets too close to their party and too far from their community, then there's almost no margin on which they're safe. And I, I, you know, I don't think, I, I like democracy and, you know, uh, I think Ben's gone now, he's got a great line about the Australian Institute, you know, we, we barrack for ideas, not for parties, and, and I mean that. Uh, I, I don't think any, I don't think, it's hard, I have friends who are committed to particular parties and have been their whole lives, I respect that. But, I, you know, with, with that comes, I have to accept them through good and ill. And I, I respect people's willingness to stick with a party during tough times. But for democracy to work well, we have to be willing to change our mind when we're really disappointed in someone. That's really our only power to show what we think. Uh, so I think safe seats are, are really, they really erode our politics because safe seats mean that the pre-selection battle is the only important battle, and the election battle is kind of irrelevant. So I think the most important, interesting thing about Kathy McGowan is a sign to all parties, if you pre-select the wrong people, then there's no such thing as a safe seat. And I, I think if you want to fill the building with nice people, that's a great message to send. I'll just respond quickly. Um, if you listen to academics, it's sort of like, oh, democracy's in decline and that people are becoming disen disenfranchised and, and disengaged and it's, it's a terrible thing that's going on. But there are some scholars out there, like Henrik Bang, who's talking about concepts like everyday makers. And this notion is that the electorate is post-material and they've changed. They're more interested in lifestyle and they're interested in issues and they're interested in causes. They're engaged, but they're not necessarily participating in traditional consultation and policy development processes. And they're, they're doing their politics and policy through social media. And his argument is that people are actually just as engaged as they have been in the past. It's just they're not engaged with major parties and they're not being born into voting for the football colours of a particular team. And, um, and what I see in Cathy McGowan, and I also see in the success of Nick Xenophon, he 25% outpolling Labor uh, in South Australia is a connection with changes in the electorate and a different sort of approach to politics and what the electorate wants and and uh, listening to having come here and listen to Cathy I was really impressed as well about the the way that her young people and, and, and drove her campaign she was the servant to the needs of her community and listening to those sorts of changes so yeah I was that was a really impressive experience for me as well I've got the microphones on this. I'll just, I should introduce myself in, in asking this question. My name's Caroline Makuta, and I had four years in the, as part of Balance of Powers Green MLA in the ACT Assembly. So it's a, I could talk and talk about all that for ages, but I, I will restrain myself. I think, I think it's a great idea you're publishing this book because one of the things that we found really, really hard, because with the four of us, it was the first time, in fact, the Greens by themselves had been the balance of power in the ACT Assembly. 
and four out of 17, we had a, yeah, there was a lot of us. And we, we did a lot of quick research trying to work out what on earth we should do at the time. One of the things we did find out was that where the Greens had been part of supporting a government part of balance of power, the next election, it had always been the case that the, that the party we supported, their vote went up and our vote went down. Which I put down to that the Greens had improved the government to where the government was. We, 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 made them, we made them actually think about what on earth they were doing and, and they've done better because of that. So I think that's one of the really important roles of having a cross-bencher, whatever description, whatever government. You, as you said, you've got, to, you've got to convince someone else. But I thought the one question I might ask you was, have you seen much difference between cross-benchers who are part of a party, particularly a party who expects to continue to be a parliamentary party as distinct from, say, the motorist who refuses to possibly don't expect to be there for, for that long. Um, is there a big difference between you know, the sort of effectively the single independent or the person who's a member of a con continuing minor party? Hmm. Look, I mean, it's a, it's a really good question, uh, and Brenton's done a great sales job on the book, so I can say, honestly, we don't really look at that. Um, uh, what we look at, in, so I'll, I'll give you my quick answer in a sec, but in the book what we're really looking at is uh, the role of crossbenchers historically, a little bit internationally. I mean, New Zealand kind of is in a permanent state of minority government now, you know, yes. New Zealand. And it's under a conservative government that's been relatively effective in being a reforming government. And, you know, the idea that you can't have stable government with minority government, well, keys up for four terms. You know, so it's just silly to say what can you know the the, the Italy stuff. You know, it's it's either major Labor Liberal in majority government in both houses or chaos in Italy. By the way, Italy is the seventh largest economy in the world. Um, great food, nice weather. <laughs> like, no, but you know, so what did they change the government a lot? Actually, their outcomes in many areas are quite good. They got their problems. Um, so, uh, so we don't actually look in the book about, so how do the parties fare or how do different structures fare. Um, I think that it's easier for an independent, I'll let, uh, I'll let Brenton tell you Nick's joke about his party room. Uh, it's easier for an independent because they don't actually have to hold a small group together. And I would argue it's easier to hold a large group together than an e a small group together. Having worked for the Democrats, who failed dismally on my watch, um, uh, <laughs> someone's got to take responsibility. <laughs> it's my fault. It wasn't Meg's, it wasn't anyone's with mine. Um, when you've got eight people or four people in a room, people's expectations about interpersonal friendships and cohesion are really high. When you've got 90, no one cares that Pine and, and Bernardi can't stand each other. No, seriously, like, of course they, there are people... Whereas if you've got a bit of rivalry in a group of four or eight, why is the leader so bad? Why can't you control your own team? So I actually think it's harder for small groups than for individuals would be, would be my observation. Uh, and, but that said, individuals just don't have the resources to be in four places at once. So, so I think it's, you know, from a policy, and from a policy point of view, a, a small group has got to be across small things and an individual. But given our focus on division and unity, no one can be more unified than, than the unitary number. <laughs> In, in some of our interviews, we do go close to the topic. It wasn't really us, it was us being told by former parliamentarians. And um, one of the things that was discussed, and I'm, I'm sure you can probably relate to this, is that uh, negotiating the party position and the parliamentary position. So when you're, the, the major parties are quite you know, strict on the follow the party line. It makes it easy to govern, but it really raises questions about representation. And the Democrats and the Greens are much higher on representation, but there's become some real practical challenges of how do you represent the party's views in a, a, a changing balance of power, like a change in 10 minutes, what's happening, and, and the party can't be aware of all the nuances, and you know, and then there's a politics at play, and so that, that difficulty of representing your party but doing the best thing and being able to justify it to the party, and that can often, and I, uh, that's what I saw in the Democrats, real difficulties in negotiating that sort of, because um, I work for the Democrats as well, around about the Meg and Tasha time. Um, 
and that was something that was talked about as a, as a, as a challenge for small parties. Um, Nick, the joke that uh, Richard was referring to was Nick says that he holds his party room meetings in front of the shaving mirror every morning. <laughs> <laughs> and, and in some respects, it, it is a little bit easier um, working for a, a solo uh, parliamentarian um, because it's just really got to uh, uh, convince him, really. Um, uh, well, I had a conversation with one of Gillard's advisors and he, he, he was uh, saying, well, I was, wish I was you. And I said, well, why? And uh, he said, well, you just got to convince your boss and things can change. I said, well, it's not that easy. He's a bit of a maverick and he's got his own mind and like, I'm just here to help. And I said, but what about you? You worked for the Deputy Prime Minister. Like, surely? He goes, oh, man. But like, you know, we have this, I this great idea and I get it past the boss. But by the time it's gone to cabinet and polling and expenditure for you, I don't even recognise my ideas when it comes back. <laughs> So I think wherever you are, this, the policy, it's not an easy, I mean, I just think, I think the challenges are different. Um, I don't think it's sort of easier in any particular way. I didn't find it easy when I was having to be on top of the whole legislation of the parliament on Nick's behalf. That wasn't too easy. Um, so yeah, I think, I think, I have a huge amount of respect for parliamentarians. I know a lot of people bag them, but I actually think that given the challenges that are going on, Changes in the media, changes in the electorate, changes in party, changes in every everything. I think that most parliamentarians are doing the best that they can in very difficult, sometimes unreconcilable policy uh, contexts. And I think our democracy is doing a really good job. Uh, while many might say that you know it's it's struggling, I think it's actually given the challenges that we've been facing. I think our democracy is something to be proud of. Uh, hi there. Oh, sorry. That's all right. No, you've got the mic, so it's all yours. <laughs> uh, my name's Stephen Bailey. I'm the election leader of the Australian Sex Party here in the ACT. Um, hi there, Caroline. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, um, I think we're on a unity ticket um, in thinking that um, if anyone thinks that a um, two-party parliamentary system is a fair representation of democracy, then they need a lobotomy. Um, I, I've got two questions. Um, I was writing an article recently for that reputable website, RIDAC, and um, I was crunching some numbers, and uh, I sort of, as an average, I, come up, I came up with uh, that 30% of the population voted for non-major parties, um, including the upper house and the lower house. It was higher in the upper house, of course. And that 30% to 33% was, um, is only realised by 10% of that representation in both houses, uh, five in the lower house and um, something like eight in the upper house. And I'm wondering if um, you have ways or ideas of addressing that uh, to make it fairer. And secondly, um, the only way that a, a Greens member or an independent is going to, um, well, a, a Greens member is going to become a senator here in the ACT, given that there are only two positions, is um, from preferences from you know uh, the Sex Party, for instance. Uh, we nearly made the quota of four percent, um, and we'd be more than happy to give uh, you, Richard, um, those preferences <laughs> if you would run. Uh, <laughs> the um, Richard, would you ever consider doing that? <laughs> uh, let me. Uh, you have to ask your wife. <laughs> uh, let me think about that. <laughs> Absolutely not. Uh, no, look, uh, thank you. And it's, it's, no, it, it's humbling. I mean, uh, it, again, if you take the view that I do, that politicians perform an important role, uh, and if you see the role as being one of representative of a community, it, it's, you know, it's, it's really nice when people say things like that to me, which is from time to time. But I actually think it's a real prick of a job. Um, uh, and I also, and this sort of, uh, I mean this, I really do, I've thought about it a lot. I mean, I, I love the kind of job that I have at the moment where I can tell you exactly what I think. And often people say, Richard, I like that you just tell me exactly what you think. And you know what, if I was working on behalf of you, I couldn't. Really, to do the job well, 
I would actually have to speak on behalf of you, which might sometimes be exactly what I thought, and actually often it wouldn't be. So I actually, while it's nice when people say, oh Richard, you know, why don't you go into parliament or something, the answer is because actually what I think I'm good at is the exact opposite. Really, the exact opposite of what I think makes a great MP. You know, Kerry Tucker, who was a Greens MP here forever, is a very good friend of mine, and we had excruciating conversations about the kind of, you know, twists and turns her head had to go through to reconcile what she felt was right and what she thought her party wanted and what she thought the electorate who put her there, which is different from the party wanted. And I really respect the kind of thought she put into that. And my job is so much simpler than that, you know? No, it is, it's simpler. You know, it's, it's, it's lonelier sometimes saying, you're all wrong, you know? But it's actually a bit easier. So, so thank you, and, and entirely dismissing your suggestion, I, I, I simultaneously appreciate it. That'll be my mum. Um, <laughs> Uh, the first part of your question, uh, I've actually got a little essay in the back of the most recent quarterly essay, which confirms what you're saying. Um, you know, so the, the, the previous quarterly essay was on Clive, and I wrote a comment on the kind of Palmer phenomena. And my comment was really about what the numbers tell us about the number of people who, who vote for minor parties, which is actually huge. Um, but also, there's some interesting numbers, I say modestly, in there, because I don't think anyone's noticed this before. At the last federal election, 25% of adult Australians didn't vote. A quarter. It's when you add up, and frankly no one had done it, uh, the number of people who aren't enrolled, the number of people who are enrolled and are no-shows, and the informals, it's 25% of the adult population. Now when you divide, here's the fun part, when you divide the Liberal vote, not by the number of people who voted, but by the number of adult Australians, 33% of people voted for Tony Abbott. For the Liberal Party. For the Liberal Party, okay, for the Abbott <laughs> government. No, good, good point, uh, very good point. Um, so where's your mandate, Tony? Two-thirds of adult Australians did not cast a vote for your party. Now, Labor's primary vote was lower, so obviously as a percentage of the adult population, Labor's primary vote was 25%. Put another way, if the can't-be-bothered votings could be bothered forming a party, <laughs> they'd be a major party. <laughs> so I actually think, and I've been talking to some of the crossbenchers about this, uh, and I think I say it in the essay, so it's not letting the cat out of the bag, um, I think we actually need a parliamentary inquiry into the state of our democracy. Because if a quarter of grown-ups aren't voting, in a system with compulsory voting, <laughs> something's gone wrong. Uh, so, and, and then of course when you combine, sorry to quote some numbers out, when you combine the didn't votes with the voted for the minor parties, you know, a very small percentage of grown-up Australians cast a valid vote for the major parties. You know, closer to half. Which, when you say it like that, it's like, okay, well, maybe something interesting is going on. So there's a lot more disenfranchised voters than we realise. Some of that disenfranchisement turns up as a minor party vote, but a lot of it's just turning up as no participation. And with compulsory voting, you know, that's a real problem. I was um, hoping that you might also say that um, perhaps... I could try. Yeah, um, I'll say it for you. <laughs> Please. Um, that perhaps uh, the quotas um, oh. be lowered. I mean, for instance, we're going through a three um, electorate system here in the ACC, yes. one electorate with seven seats, to five electorates with five seats. Um, and it seems like, to me, and, and Shane Rattenbury and I both agree on this, that... Um, uh, the two major parties are just trying to solidify their stranglehold yeah. on... Uh, Look, I, I, no, you, actually, when you first started, no. you, you're spot on. I, when you first started, I thought, oh, there's a simple answer to your questions. Proportional representation in the lower house. Um, you know, Australia has a first past the post, really, with preferential, which I like preferential voting. I don't like optional preferential. I like preferential voting. Uh, but proportional representation in the lower house would generate a fundamentally different lower house. 
Don't forget the National Party poll 5% and get the Deputy Prime Minister. Yes. All right? And, and veto over trade policy. So we're very comfortable with minor parties exerting disproportionate influence, but the National Party have the fluke of their voters live near each other. So they get a disproportionate number of lower house seats, even though they're a trivial percentage uh, of the total vote. I think, just off the top of my head, I'm pretty sure that the Palmer Party outpolled the National Party in primary vote. <coughs> that's how, but the Nats, they all live near each other. All right, and that's fine. That's kind of what our democracy anticipated, but proportional representation uh, would change that. The ACT is the most underrepresented uh, uh, geography in Australia. Um, our electorates are twice the size of a Tasmanian electorate. Um, you know, we, we, we clearly need three lower house seats in the ACT. Depending how those boundaries are drawn, the Greens could conceivably win one of those. Um, whether or not uh, whether or not the Labor and Liberal Party can agree that that's a bad thing, or Labor and Greens can agree that's a good thing, will, <laughs> will be an interesting conversation. Uh, but a third seat here in the ACT will, will change that. Uh, and of course, um, you know, Tasmania has twelve senators, and you have two. You know. So, and by the way, I kind of forgot this. Our constitution demands that Tasmania has five lower house seats. It's actually in the Constitution. Um, I, I knew that and I forgot about it until recently. So, so yeah, our, we can always tinker with our democracy. I think we should, uh, but we should do it carefully and we should do it in ways that put, I think, put more voices into the Parliament, not less, and force parties to talk to each other. Because again, John Kay in New Zealand, <coughs> four-term Prime Minister from minority government who's introduced a wide range of reforms, many of which I hate. Um, but he had to talk to people to get it through. I think the question was directed at you, and I, I vote for you, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> and I've worked with him. Uh, look, really quick response. I'm a bit more like, um, for things to change, the major parties are going to have to shift in their positions, give up some power. That will have to come from electoral pressure. So at the moment, I think the challenge is people don't understand the electoral system we have. And they don't understand minority government, and it's very hard to get the electoral pressure for change. Hello, oh, Richard. Hey, Charlie. I, I have a question. Just um, going back to your first comment about the, I guess, the main job of parliamentarians once they are voted in is to represent their constituents and, and pass bills. So my question is about the ability to do that, and whether an increasing level of minority parties and independence uh, affects that ability, uh, you know, negative or positive, to actually uh, have that smooth process of uh, processing bills, or does that in some way get in the way, does it slow down the process because more shaping has to occur before you can actually uh, get to that point of voting for a bill? Yeah, look, look, great question. And I think the short answer is yes. Uh, the more voices that need to be consulted, the slower it will be. But I just, I don't think that's a problem. Um, and that's exactly what the Constitution anticipated. Uh, if we wanted executive government to pass ledge quickly, you just never would have come up with an upper house. And if you wanted that upper house to represent Australia broadly, you never would have given Tasmania 12 senators. You know, so the, no, I mean, the compact that brought us together at Federation was a compact that didn't put too much power into the hands of, of one usually man, but typically person, uh, who, who, who is our prime minister, who is, you know, prime minister first amongst equals, you know. So, no, there's no doubt that more voices in the parliament mean, uh, mean more consultation. But it doesn't follow, Let, let's flip it on its head, let's, let's knock the minor parties and the micro parties out, and let's just imagine a parliament where you've got uh, a government and an opposition. Well, there's only two possibilities. One, the government of the day is a majority in both houses and everything passes instantly. Or, a government of the day doesn't have the numbers in the house, the opposition has the numbers in one house, and nothing controversial passes for three years. And for me, given those two extreme scenarios, I reckon having a crossbench and it's interesting, people say, oh, there's eight people on the crossbench. No, there's 18. 
Well, ten of them are greens and eight of them aren't, then together that's the crossbench. One of the government's problems, and I'd argue one of the Greens' problems, has been a kind of refusal to kind of talk to each other. Um, I think there's blame on both sides there. But there's 18 people on the crossbench who can deliver the government the six votes they need. And frankly, if an idea of the Prime Minister's can't get six people who aren't in threat of their pre-selection from the Prime Minister, which is what it boils down to. Again, pre-selection is a scarier thing for most politicians in election. If you can't talk six people who don't report to you into doing something, then I kind of think you've got a problem. Um, and, you know, there's a joke in the book, and hey, it's an academic book, but we still stuck a joke in there. Uh, anyone know what the Americans uh, call crossing the floor? Voting. <laughs> hey, you've got to laugh. Um, they don't have a term for it. Republicans don't vote the way the Republican leadership tells them to. Democrats don't vote the way the Democrat leadership do. Who's the crazy right winger? Paul Ron Ron Paul? Ron Paul. Yeah, um, he, he voted for car subsidies for auto workers. And he hates government. Hates taxpayers' money being wasted. Guess who works in his electorate? Auto workers. I mean, ideology only goes so far in the US where they face election every two years two years and there is no block voting you have to explain to your voters why you not your party why you voted for or against something so block voting as i said before at the beginning major parties are the ones that place crossbenchers in this position of absolute power because their determination to vote as a block means that the swing vote is always the minor party but in america you know, presidents can thunder away about what the Democrats should or shouldn't do, and they all look at their voters and think, man, I'm not, I'm not voting for that. <laughs> I want to be here when your term expires. <laughs> uh, just to add to Richard's comments, uh, looking at, at it from inside a parliamentarian's office uh, can sometimes shed some light. So um, if you've got commitments for, uh, say, $600 million, and um, you think that you can push for more, but you're conscious that uh, if you seem to be too much of a nut job or pushing too far, they just go back to the opposition and you're out of the game and you lose your 600 million. Um, those things are pressures on you. And, and I mean, I'm sure, I'm, I'm certain, I mean, when I worked for Nick, we had a policy I wasn't allowed to go into gambling institutions. So I'm sure, I know he doesn't roll the dice when he's making his <laughs> decision about how far will I push. Well, Don't tell him I yeah. bet. Good thing he didn't put that joke in the book. Um, so there is, there, there's, there's a kind of, there's a personal and, and there's, there's a level inside this that I think that um, we need to, to think about how it works. Yes, it does slow things down, but at every election, um, more people vote against the major parties in the Senate than they do in the House. So they, they clearly want something to be happening about accountability and things taking longer. And just a quick third observation, on um, more than one occasion, our interview, he said to us that, hey, you know, we had the argy-bargy back and forth, the amended bill went through, and the minister came up to me and said, thank you very much. We've got better policy. I couldn't have got that through my party room or the cabinet. But thank you. So there's relationships across and between. It's really easy to look from outside and think everybody's in their tribes and in their blocks, but there's a lot more going on in between. Um, so maybe slower, um, but I agree with Richard. I think it's better. Um, sorry, I can come to you in a second. That'll probably be the last question. But just on that, because a few people seem surprised by what Brenton just said, uh, I agree entirely. Uh, when I worked for Natasha for so 2001, 2002, Democrats and Balance of Power, uh, I had plenty of meetings with ministers and or their chiefs of staff, often late at night, often in my office, that started with, Richard, you know, just between us, <laughs> here's a bill that you haven't seen yet, and you're gonna hate it. But a clever bloke like you might come up with amendments that look like this, <laughs> or like this, or like this. I'm not kidding. Now think about it, this is smart. All right, this is a minister or their chief of staff starting a conversation with this will be a negotiated outcome. Now the farce of external politics requires 
me to say that there will be no negotiation. And of course, the whole time I'm saying that, you and I will have open communication about that negotiation. And then when we've settled on something we both can agree on, we'll both go back and try and talk our own parties into the something is better than nothing. But this is all delegated responsibility. I've never voted for a bill in my life. Right? Again, I'm not a parliamentarian, I don't aspire to be one. So I could negotiate with a minister till I was blue in the face. I then still had to go and say to a whole bunch of people who were elected by somebody, well, look, they've got this bill, you know, these amendments would make it better. You know, is it the end of the world that we lose this, we get this? But I've never, on your behalf or anyone's, made that decision. So Brenton's spot on. These, the, and I, I hate to say it, our, the, the way that our media describe politics denies both the complexity, but I would also suggest denies the existence of the most interesting part.